As long as human culture and imagination have existed, giant versions of both man and beast have held a special place in our stories. The concept of larger than life has always inspired awe, as much in the realm of nature as the world of architectural wonders or the desire for universal fame. So it's no real surprise that the avian masters of the sky are often grown to a mythical size in our histories and narratives. From the elephant hunting rocks of the Middle East to the storm-bringing thunderbirds of North America. Giant birds have been a staple of folklore and myth for countless generations. But, like the mighty dinosaurs and the infamous Megalodon, truly massive birds did once exist, and they have even contributed to some of these legends. Hi there, I'm Cassie. Today on Gone From Earth, we're going to talk about the giant pteratorn, one of the biggest flying birds to ever live. The giant pteratorn, Argentavis magnificens, was a member of the pteratorn family, birds of prey that lived in the Americas from about 25 million until about 10,000 years ago. This particular species of pteratorn lived during the Miocene epoch, around 6 to 8 million years ago, and was found in what is now Argentina. Its closest living relatives are the New World vultures and condors, the latter of which include some of the biggest flying birds today. Also like modern condors, the giant pteratorn is widely believed to have scavenged for most of its food. This sets it apart from other pteratorns, which are generally thought to have actively hunted most of their prey. Why the difference? Well, it all comes down to that massive size. While all pteratorns were huge, the giant pteratorn truly earned its name. These birds had a wingspan of up to 6.5 or even 7 meters, or 21 to about 23 feet, and are thought to have weighed 70 to 72 kilograms or 154 to 159 pounds. As far as wingspan goes, that's about the size of a small aircraft. By contrast, the next largest pteratorn, Aelornis incredibilis, is thought to have had a wingspan of about 5.5 meters and weighed only about 23 kilograms. This huge size brings a lot of challenges. First and foremost, the square cube law says that a flying animal's weight increases with bigger sizes at the cubic rate of volume compared to the squared rate of its wing area and flight muscle strength. Simply put, this means that bigger birds like pteratorns tend to get bigger weight increases at larger sizes than they do the ability to lift that weight, assuming everything stays proportional. The giant pteratorn's airplane wingspan helped with the weight problem by giving it more wing area compared to its body size than what a smaller bird might have. However, its wings were so long that they didn't have room to properly flap when the pteratorn was standing on level ground. So, how did the giant pteratorn fly? For the answer to that question, we can actually look at some of the present day's biggest birds. Remember how I said the closest living relatives of pteratorns are vultures and condors? Well, condors actually make use of their environment to help them fly. They'll nest and rest on cliff sides and similar inclines, and can use drop-off points and the wind to get themselves into the air. Likewise, today's flying bird with the largest wingspan, the wandering albatross, uses the wind beneath its impressive wings to get enough lift for takeoff. Both condors and albatrosses are built for soaring, using the wind and the shape of their wings to travel great distances without having to spend much energy on flapping. Giant pteratorns had similarly shaped wings to condors and are believed to have been master soarers and gliders as well. From their homes in the Andean foothills and windy plains of Argentina, they would have made use of slopes, warm wind currents, and updrafts to travel far throughout their territories in search of food. 
And by focusing on seeking out carrion and using their intimidating sizes to chase other hunters from their kills, these birds would have been able to eat at their leisure without having to worry about landing and taking off with their food. When they did hunt, they likely went after small prey that they could swoop down on, grab, kill, and eat without landing. Because of its impressive size, strong legs, and sharp, powerful beak, the giant pteratorn would have been an apex predator, despite its preference for scavenging. They wouldn't have had many, if any, natural predators, and based on their population numbers and breeding rate, mortality was likely low and came mostly from old age and disease. But sadly, even these mightiest of birds did one day fall. It is unknown when exactly the giant pteratorn went extinct, but the South American pteratorn species drop off the fossil records by the Pleistocene epoch, when the last of the pteratorns ruled the skies of North America. It's speculated that the pteratorn family ultimately went extinct due to rapidly shifting climates at the end of the last ice age. Their decline may have been aided by competition and hunting from early human tribes that were migrating to the Americas at around the same time. That said, it's also been suggested that fossils or even early sightings of the North American pteratorns contributed to the Thunderbird so widely spread in the Native American stories. Whatever the reason, today the giant pteratorn and its closest relatives thrive only in our fossil records and our imaginations. The Thunderbirds that so resemble these magnificent flyers have achieved a modern day cryptid status, with reports still coming in from time to time of massive birds of prey supposedly being spotted in the American skies. And while it's extremely unlikely that these accounts are of surviving pteratorns, it's quite possible that some of them are exaggerations of condor sightings, bringing a mythic quality to the modern cousins of the giant pteratorn. Regardless of their source, the existence of these stories proves that, in a way, the real life Thunderbird still rules the sky. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on our next adventure.